The Earth revolves around the sun. But it wasn't always that way. The sun used to revolve around the Earth. It was like that for hundreds of years, until it was discovered to be otherwise. And even for a few hundred years after that. But ultimately, after much kicking and screaming, the Earth did, in fact, begin to revolve around the sun. Christianity was wrong about the solar system. What if it's wrong about something else, too? Put your hands together Every single day of your life Put your hands together This movie's about what happened when I went looking for Jesus. Jesus was our Lord and Savior, and um, we were out of fellowship with, with God, and He loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son so that He could be the mediator between us, people that He created in His likeness, and Himself. Who was Jesus? Jesus was the Messiah to the Jews, and uh, He is the Savior to mankind. He is the Son of God who came to save us, and He came here to, to give His life for our sins. Jesus is somebody that came into this world. Uh, he came as a human and uh, he came and died for us, shed his blood so that we might have salvation. Jesus was the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. And uh, that's the best answer I can give you to who he is. He was someone who just came out of incredible love for the world to, to give his life for everyone. And so to me, I guess Jesus is my savior. You can't really know if the theory is true or not until you try it. So I would say try Jesus. Look at how happy Christians are when they're talking about Jesus. Put your hands together. How come I'm not this happy? I want to be this happy. Put your hands together. Of course, those aren't the only faces of Christianity. So I guess it's kind of a mixed bag. In case you haven't heard the story before, here is a, a brief uh, recap. It all started here in this field. Uh, some shepherds were sleeping and they were awoken by a star. Uh, and then an angel of the Lord came and said a new king was being born in Bethlehem. And then uh, this happened. And then the shepherds rushed off to find the new king who was being born. Meanwhile, back at the manger, the Virgin Mary gave birth without complications, and the word of this new king named Jesus had spread all across the land, and three magi showed up with gifts, and everybody celebrated the birth of the baby Jesus. King Herod had heard about this new king who was being born, and he sent his troops out to kill all the male babies in the area. So an angel of the Lord came to warn Joseph, and he was able to get his family out of the country and into Egypt. When Jesus was 12 years old, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem for the Passover, as was the custom. As they were returning home with relatives and friends, they suddenly realized Jesus was not with them. 
Have you seen Jesus anywhere? No, I haven't. I thought he was with you. We missed him coming out of Jerusalem, but we thought he might have been with friends. After searching for three days, they finally decided to come to the temple and ask about Jesus. And there they found him, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. How is it that you sought me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? And then Jesus went missing for 18 years. Uh, when he appears again, he's 30 years old and in need of baptism. Uh, so he went to John the Baptist who performed the service. And uh, after he was baptized, Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. And then it was on to the miracles. Lazarus, come forth. And then Jesus hit Jerusalem. And uh, I mean, he really hit Jerusalem. He was very angry at the present authorities and they felt the same way about him. This man Jesus has stirred up the people from Galilee to Jerusalem with his false teachings. You'll do a great service by helping us to rid the nation of this false prophet. Jesus knew he was going to die the next day, so he prepared one last meal with his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I demand by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ. I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God. He has uttered blasphemy. Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? Death to the blasphemer. He should die. It was still very early in the morning when Pilate received the news. The sun has not yet risen. Why was it necessary to call me down here at this hour? The chief priest demanded that you be called, sir. They want quick judgment of this man. Here is your king. Shall I crucify your king? Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And then Jesus rose from the dead. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. After Jesus died and was resurrected, 
In your own words, what happened then? How did Christianity begin to spread? Uh, Christianity spread from Pentecost on, I guess you could say. And it was through the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe, that the word of the gospel spread. Why is it that Christians can be so specific about the life of Christ, but they're vague about what happened after he left? And it was according to God's divine plan, because as you look through history, you can see how God um, put certain circumstances or events to take place to help the gospel spread across the world. Aren't Christian leaders telling them the story? Do you know much about how Christianity spread in those early days? What spread through word of mouth, you know, I know that uh, through through what I've learned, you know, it's it's it has spread throughout history. The the Holy Spirit descended upon them and gave them uh, really the, the 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 power and the ability to talk about Jesus and and share him with other people in the world. Let's go back in time to see what really did happen. Uh, too far. Let's go back to the first century in the year of our Lord. Jesus Christ is said to have lived this life here in the first three decades of the century, dying somewhere around the year 33. The Gospels all came later. Mark was the first one written, and the other three are clearly derived from Mark. Mark mentions the destruction of the Jewish temple, which happened in the year 70. So the Gospels all came later than that, probably much later. There's a gap of four decades or more. Most of what we know about this period comes from a man who says he saw Jesus Christ come to him in a vision. He was the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. After many days of hard traveling, Saul's caravan was near its destination, Damascus. The journey was nearly over. Then suddenly, He is ill. The light, the light. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? Paul says the Lord told him to start spreading the word of Jesus Christ, and he did it with a vengeance. Your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. For I see that you are in the bond of iniquity. Paul was a bit of a scold, but the salvation he offered through the God he called Christ Jesus was very popular. He traveled widely and in his wake left behind groups of new Christians who formed the early Christian church. Paul wrote lots of letters about Christianity. In fact, he wrote 80,000 words about the Christian religion. These documents represent almost all we have of the history of Christianity during this decades-long gap. And here's the interesting thing. If Jesus was a human who had recently lived, nobody told Paul. Paul never heard of Mary, Joseph, Bethlehem, Herod, John the Baptist. He never heard about any of these miracles. He never quotes anything that Jesus is supposed to have said. He never mentions Jesus having a ministry of any kind at all. He doesn't know about any entrance into Jerusalem. He never mentions Pontius Pilate or a Jewish mob or any trials at all. Paul doesn't know any of what we would call the story of Jesus, except for these last three events. And even these, Paul never places on earth. Just like the other savior gods of the time, Paul's Christ Jesus died, rose, and ascended all in a mythical realm. Paul doesn't believe that Jesus was ever a human being. He's not even aware of the idea. And he's the link between the time frame given for the life of Jesus and the appearance of the first gospel account of that life. This is why you don't hear many Christian leaders talking about the early days of Christianity. Because once you assemble the facts, the story is that Jesus lived, everyone forgot. And then they remember. This is just a but it gets even shakier than that. Allegorical literature was extremely common back then. This is just a this is just a 
Mark himself probably did not believe he was writing history. He was writing a symbolic message. He was writing a gospel, you know, the good news, and symbolizing it using, uh, you know, biblical parallels, using parallels to pagan religions and so forth. There are these other gospels, which, and there are the Apocrypha after all. There are Apocryphal New Testament and Apocryphal Old Testament stories that were, frankly, were too folkloristic and they got thrown out because people thought these are these couldn't have happened, therefore we get rid of them. But of course, some of the, story, the apocryphal stories are as interesting as the regular Bible. So yeah, they, they, they kept in walking on water and rising from the dead, they kept but the in, others, those yeah, were well, not there, too outlandish. Well, there have been attempts to so-called, it's called demythologizing. There have been attempts mostly by Jesuits and other intellectuals who say, uh, who are upset by the, in a sense, the folklore, if you like. And they say, we've got to, let's make this more intellectual. Let's get rid of the folklore. Let's get rid of the virgin birth, which it seems unlikely. Let's get rid of all this stuff. But of course, if you take away the folklore, from, away from the Bible, you don't have a heck of a lot left except begat, 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 begat. Well, in the case of someone like Caesar Augustus, around whom many of the same myths clustered, we know there nonetheless was a Caesar Augustus because he's intricately tied into the history of the time and many secular historians talk about it. You, you can't rewrite history without Caesar Augustus. But uh, at the very two points Jesus appears to be locked into history. These stories are, are either still mythical, like the slaughter of the innocents derived right out of the book of Exodus, or they, they contain outrageous improbabilities, such as the, the Jewish Supreme Council meeting on Passover Eve to get rid of these guys. It's just out of the question. Or Pontius Pilate letting go a known killer of Romans, an insurrectionist Barabbas, and just letting Jesus Jesus uh, be thrown to the mob uh, after, however, trying to get him off the hook as if he has to uh, have a vote on it. It just defies any kind of historical verisimilitude. And then when you realize, well, you know, there were other ancient Jews and Jewish Christians that believed Jesus had been killed a century before under King Alexander Janias. Or in the Gospel of Peter, it says that Herod had Jesus killed. Well, what, how could this be uh, a matter of, of such diversity if it was a recent event that people remembered? It just begins to make you wonder, is this man really part of a historical time stream? Or does it, doesn't it begin to look like someone has tried to put a, a figure, originally mythical, into a historical framework and made various stabs at it? Can you give me an example of a story that started as fiction, that's known to have been fiction, and then it became considered real with the addition of details? Oh, well, we've seen this any number of times in, say, our blurred stories, where, where stories have started out as actual works of fiction, where they were written by, by, by identifiable authors, they were written and provided as works of fiction. And they have since gained a life and a spread on their own where they are now told and, and relayed as true stories, as this really happened tales, and are believed as such. You ever read that news story about the guy who was found dead and they couldn't figure out how he died? But when they did the autopsy, they found out he had a can of spam shoved down his throat? Turns out he was a spammer and that's why he got killed. People like the moral of that story, which is why I made it up. And when I first posted it on my weblog, I labeled it as fiction. Jesus' life does conform to the hero pattern. It's a hero pattern with so many incidents. Raglan gave a score. He took actually the, the Oedipus, to of all things, as the basic uh, 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 model, and then gave other heroes scores as to how many of the 22 points they had in their lives. Because Raglan's, it's Raglan's pattern that is the one that I used. His mother is, here's the hero of tradition from Raglan's The Hero. I'm getting this from the study of folklore, an early book that I edited. His mother is a royal virgin. His father is a king, often a near relative of his mother. But four, the circumstances of his conception are unusual. Five, he's also reputed to be the son of a god. Six, at birth an attempt is made often by his father to kill him. But seven, he's spirited away and eight, reared by foster parents in a far country. <laughs> Nine, we're told nothing of his childhood, but ten, on reaching manhood, he returns or goes to his future kingdom. And Eleven, after a victory over a king or a giant or a dragon, he marries a princess. Twelve, thirteen, becomes king. 
14 reigns uneventfully, but 15 prescribes laws. 16 later, he loses favor with his subjects. 17 is driven from the throne of the city. 18, he meets with a mysterious death. 19, often at the top of a hill. 20, his children, if any, do not succeed him. 21, his body is not buried, but nevertheless, 22, he has one or more holy sepulchers. So, uh, Oedipus gets 22 points out of the 22. Theseus gets 20. Romulus, 17. Hercules, 17. Perseus, 16, etc. I don't remember off the top how many Jesus got, but it was high. You were just an illustration. There are other similar savior figures in the same neighborhood at the same time in history. Mithras, Attis, Adonis, Osiris, Tammuz, and so forth. Uh, and uh, nobody thinks that these characters are anything but mythical. Uh, and their stories are so similar, most of them in fact having some kind of resurrection or another, uh, sometimes even with celebrations after three days and so forth, that uh, it, it just seems like special pleading to uh, say, oh well in this one case it, it really happened. church fathers understood this as a problem because they were already getting the same objections from pagans. They said, what you say about Jesus? We've been saying about the you know, Dionysus and Hercules all the time. What's the big deal? And they didn't believe in them either anymore. And so the uh, Christian apologists, the defenders of the faith would say, well, yeah, but this one is true. And uh, you see, Satan counterfeited it in advance because he knew this day would come. Boy, I tell you, that, that, that tells you two things right there, that even they didn't deny that these other Jesus-like characters were before Jesus, or they never would have resorted to something like that. Satan knew it would happen and counterfeited it in advance. In case you're wondering, uh, yes, this remains the explanation to this day. Fortunately for Christian leaders, they almost never have to offer it. I'm wondering if either one of you are familiar with um, Osiris or Mithras or Dionysus? I'm not. Hardly at all. <laughs> okay. I'm wondering if you've heard of Osiris or Mithra or Dionysus. Uh, I've heard of Dionysus. Uh, the other two, I, I don't think I've heard of. And do you know anything about Dionysus? Uh, no, it sounds like an interesting Greek name, but no. Uh, was, he, uh, was he a contemporary of, the, of Jesus or the early church? I'm wondering if you've heard any of those theories or... Well, you know it's probably good that I haven't. I've never heard of any of those gods. Okay, but if you were... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of any of those pagan gods, no. <laughs> no, I, I haven't heard about it. Are, are you familiar with um, uh, Osiris or Mithra? Or Dionysus? I've heard about them, but I really haven't really like really got into it and re making research on what it was about. I really haven't. So, but I've heard about it. It's it's been on the news a couple times, but I've never really paid attention to it. No. Is there anything that you that you know or that you've gathered from those no, articles? I really haven't. I really haven't paid attention to it. I just it's all about Jesus, man. That's all you got to pay attention to, you know. For thousands of years, humanity has been obsessed with blood sacrifice. Is it an accident that the story of the crucifixion of Jesus gave Christians a suffering hero whose flesh they could eat? 
and whose blood they could drink? Of course, Christians today aren't obsessed with blood sacrifice anymore. Oh, well, except that they are. For many Christians, the passion of the Christ was the single most powerful experience of their lives. I selected these quotations and I cut them all together, but I haven't enhanced the sound effects or the visuals in any way. This stuff is all in the movie, as you see and hear it right here. When it comes to Jesus movies, this movie is far and away the number one choice of Christians. Adjusted for inflation, the singing Jesus made $55 million at the U.S. box office. The horny Jesus made $13 million. But the bloody Jesus? $370 million and still counting. Did you see that? Let's go back for a second. You have to have a special effects guy with a little squirty thing just off camera to get this shot. Mel Gibson went out of his way to emphasize the blood. In fact, if you were to go through this film minute by minute and make a note every time that any blood, violence, or suffering were depicted on screen, it would look like this. The first 10 minutes go by without much gore, but for the remaining 109 minutes, only six contain no blood, violence, or suffering. Any film represents hundreds or thousands of individual decisions made by the director. Mel Gibson could have made his Jesus movie any way he wanted to and he chose to make it this way. And he was right. Christians said, yes, this is the film we want. We've got to raise up an army. I don't want to wait no
Let me propose something. Religion does no harm at all. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> Uh, well, of course, you know, evidence of history and even contemporary events uh, refutes that. Um, Whatever. E yeah, even, even if we set aside, you know, the, the obvious war, conflict, violence uh, that has always plagued society and has gotten particularly worse under the Judeo-Christian religions, um, even if we set that aside, we have ordinary, everyday things that are going wrong. Uh, the sort of dehumanization and mistreatment of homosexuals, for example, is, is a prominent example, and it's getting worse in this country, actually. Uh, it was getting better for a while, but now there's this backlash, and that's, that's bad. That's bad for humanity, it's, and, and a religion that encourages that or even allows that is wrong. I uh, agree with capital punishment, and I believe that homosexuality is one of those that could be coupled with uh, murder and, and other sins. It would be the government that um, is, sits upon this land who would be executing the homosexuals. If certain fundamentalist Christians had their way, we would put gay people to death. And you know what? We should do that. We should strap them right to this gurney and lethally inject them. Because God does hate fags. The real question is why moderate Christians don't agree with God. Because when it comes to his rules, God is not a moderate. Don't you commit yourself to some political party or politician. You commit yourself to the principles of God and demand those parties and politicians align themselves with the eternal values in this book. And America will be forever the greatest nation on this earth. You ever notice what a bad rap the Inquisition gets? Even some Christians today think it was a bad idea. But how could it be a bad idea? If the Bible is right, aren't the stakes as high as they can be? If a little suffering here on earth saves more souls for all eternity, isn't that a good thing? The Inquisition was not a perversion of Christian doctrine. The Inquisition was an expression of Christian doctrine. It's interesting to me at great political rallies how you have a a Protestant to pray and a Catholic to pray and then you have a Jew to pray. With all due respect for those dear people, my friend, God Almighty does not hear the prayer of a Jew, for how in the world can God hear the prayer of a man who says Jesus Christ is not the true Messiah? You know what? He's right. Imagine if you killed your own child, like God did, and then the people you did it for didn't recognize your sacrifice. Of course you wouldn't hear their prayers. Mel Gibson was right to portray the Jews as evil. These must be the most despicable people on earth. Unless this book is wrong. And if this book is wrong, what the hell is moderate Christianity? Jesus was only sort of the Son of God? He only somewhat rose from the dead? Your eternal soul is at stake, but you shouldn't make a big deal out of it? Moderate Christianity makes no sense. Is it any wonder that so many people choose the Christian leaders who actually have the courage of their convictions? Many people imagine that uh, belief in, in the end of days and the, the idea that Jesus is in this generation likely to come down out of the clouds and save the day, it, we imagine that this is not, this is a fringe conviction. It really isn't. The rapture is uh, described in the Bible in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 verses 16 and 17 as being when Jesus Christ comes back to earth and takes up his church to heaven. And uh, the church is all the people that are believers in him and not uh, the buildings. 22% of Americans claim to be certain that Jesus is going to come back to earth and judge the living and the dead sometime in the next 50 years. Another 22% think he probably will. So that's 44% that's of the electorate who are basically convinced that he's coming back in their lifetime. Personally, I think it's going to happen within my lifetime. Um, I'm 47 now, and if I live a normal life, then that would be in the next 20 or 30 years. Now when you unpack what that conviction entails, it, it is perfectly maladaptive 
to planning for a sustainable future for the, the human race. It's not, it's, it's, it's maladaptive, certainly when it comes time to avoid global conflict because by the, by the lights of, of these prophecies, global conflict is actually the, the precursor to Jesus coming back. Hearing uh, different uh, Bible scholars saying the things that are going on in the, in the world today, um, pretty much everything has happened that the Bible said has to happen uh, before the return of Jesus Christ. So if it's all happened, we're pretty much uh, ready to go at any moment. It really is not an exaggeration to say that there is some significant percentage of the American electorate which if they turned on their television today and saw that a, a mushroom cloud had replaced Jerusalem, uh, they would see a silver lining in that cloud. About six years ago, I, upon inspiration by God, I believe, I started a website called raptureletters.com. The website is provided for people that have spoken with their relatives and loved ones about the kingdom of heaven and uh, haven't been able to witness to them properly or they just weren't convinced of anything. So they can go on my website and put a name and an email address and the people will get sent a letter after the rapture takes place. The letter will uh, hopefully provide some comfort to uh, those people that receive it and uh, let them know that their loved ones are in heaven now and that uh, it also gives them a message and uh, allows them to uh, say a prayer to become uh, saved and hopefully uh, get into heaven themselves. Insofar as people like that elect our, our presidents and, and congressmen and insofar as they get elected as presidents and congressmen, that's a, a terribly dangerous state of affairs. You'll have someone make up a fake quote or misrepresent the document, misrepresent the evidence. Then they'll put it on a website or put it in a book that's published by pe what people think is a respectable publisher. And then hundreds, thousands of Christians will read this and believe it because they assume, well, this guy wouldn't lie. He wouldn't have made this stuff up. And so they go and repeat it. And so you get the lie repeated many times, mostly by people who aren't lying, who really do think it's true, but they just didn't check. 101 last day prophecies, just some of the things that are supposed to happen. Literal Babylon, uh, formerly called Babel, would reemerge in the land of Shinar. The land of Shinar is known as modern day Iraq. And Saddam Hussein spent uh, over 20 years rebuilding um, literal Babylon. As a matter of fact, I heard he had Madonna come in to christen it. Faith really is a conversation stopper. If somebody says, it's my faith that, that, soul, that life is sacred and, and uh, God creates life and man should not meddle in it, and that really stops the conversation. There's no, you, you can't challenge someone further and treat them uh, as though they're drawing their ethics out of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which is really what I think we should be able to do. When, when, when the President of the United States says, I, I plan to appoint common sense judges who know that our rights are derived from God, I think someone in the White House press corps should be able to stand up and say, how is that different from thinking you're going to appoint common sense judges who think our rights are de derived from Zeus? And that's clearly an impertinent question, but it's a totally reasonable question. Unfortunately, it says in the Bible that there will be a multitude of people that go to heaven after the rapture as well as the 144,000 male virgin Jews. Um, the, the multitude will be wearing white robes. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation. And uh, the number is too numerous to count, it says. But those people are also martyred. Most of them will lose their heads over their faith. So it's much better to accept Jesus as your Savior now and get taken up in the rapture than it would be to wait till afterwards and have to lose your head over something like that. I don't want to wait. You know, here's the thing about Scott. I like him. He's a nice guy. He's a productive member of his community. He's a contractor with his own business. He supports his wife and kids. He's not crazy. At least, I hope he's not because I used to believe the same things that Scott believes.
common blood of a dead man, and all life within it will die. Man will be scorched with great heat. Man will be covered with noisome and grievous doors. The island of the sea will fade away. There will be lightning and thunder. 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 Are you ready to pass through all these horrible experiences? And then go on to and a black go eternity. On to a black and then eternity. go on to a black eternity. Yes, I used to be a fundamentalist Christian. I learned the doctrine at my school, Village Christian School in Sun Valley, California. Our school mascot was a crusader because our mission was to do battle with the secular world. But not just the secular world. We also knew that Satan worked through other versions of Christianity and we fought those too. In chapel every Friday, we learned the only way to salvation was to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And every week, we had an opportunity to accept Jesus as our personal savior. Well, what is salvation? Well, it's the opposite of damnation. I learned that hell is a real place where you really do go if you have not been forgiven by Jesus Christ. When the school says that each student will be encouraged to develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this is what encouragement means. Be forgiven or be damned. But Jesus was a great guy. He'd forgive you for anything. Lying, murder, internet pornography, anything. He'd even forgive you for speaking against Jesus himself. But apparently just to make things interesting, Jesus did add one extra rule to the mix. There actually is one unforgivable sin. Denial of the Holy Spirit. If you do that, you are eternally damned. It says so right there in the Bible, twice. It's a doubly infallible rule. Deny the Holy Spirit and you can never, ever go anywhere but hell. And as luck would have it, the Holy Spirit is the easiest thing in the entire doctrine to doubt. God is out of your reach. Jesus was 2,000 years ago, but the Holy Spirit is with you right here, right now. So you'd better really actually feel the Holy Spirit. You can't deny it in your thoughts because Jesus is in your thoughts. And if your mind starts to wander to the fact that there's no more evidence for the existence of this Holy Spirit than there is for the existence of unicorns, guess what you may have done? The greatest crime in fundamentalist Christianity is to think. And when I was at Village Christian, I was terrified that I'd accidentally done this. Fortunately, I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, so I could talk to him about this stuff. And in Friday Chapel, I often did. I asked Jesus if he could forgive me, even if I had doubted the existence of the Holy Spirit. Of course, I had no way of knowing if he would. As you may have been able to tell, I have since stopped believing in such crazy things. But I often wonder if there are kids right now at Village Christian going through the same struggles that I did. And I also wonder how the smart, caring, obviously busy people who run Village Christian can teach children these false, terrifying ideas about how the world operates. So I headed back to Village Christian schools to talk to the man in charge about what he teaches children and why. What would you say is the basic Christian doctrine that is taught here to all students? The position that we've taken is this, that those things that we are going to be dogmatic about are those that are essential to salvation. Bottom line is this, who do you say Jesus is and what do you do with him? All the rest, we'll talk about it and those are interesting things to talk about and it helps us understand some things, but the only thing that makes any difference is who do you say Jesus is and what do you do with him? So that's what we major on. That's what we spend time delivering. That's how, if we don't do anything else uh, from a spiritual point of view, we want kids to understand that they need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and then we have to figure out how to make that happen. Our religions are, are the area in which we tolerate dogma with, completely uncritically. Uh, you know, to deny that the Holocaust ever happened or to assert that uh, you know you're in dialogue with extraterrestrials is pretty much synonymous with, with craziness in our culture. Uh, and it is so because we, we challenge people when they believe things strongly without evidence or, or in, in contradiction to a mountain of evidence, uh, uh, except on matters of faith. 
in the handbook, uh, there's a statement of faith. Uh, and uh, it has seven points, and some of them are, we believe the Bible to be the inspired, the only infallible, authoritative word of God. Uh, we believe that there is one God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost. They that are saved unto the resurrection of life, and they that are lost unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, tell me, what hard scientific evidence do you have that the world works this way? Well, the mistake that a lot of Christians make is trying to convince people that what they believe spiritually um, can be proven. Now, first of all, there is a lot of historical evidence that Jesus was who he said he was. There is a lot of historical evidence that proves his resurrection. So if you want, if you're looking for historical and scientific data that proves whether Jesus was and existed and resurrected, there's evidence that, that, that will produce that. But the fact of the matter is, it's, it is a faith issue. If you're trying to get a medical degree and you have all kinds of ideas about human health that, that, are, that cannot be substantiated by evidence, uh, and you talk about your own strong convictions uh, and yet can't deduce any reasons for them, you are, you know, not only are you not getting a degree, you are just, you're essentially laughed out of the room. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, lives depend on that being the case. Have I ever seen God? No. Have you? No. No. How do I know he's there? How do I know that what scripture says is true? Can I prove that with empirical data that says it's true? No. It's a faith issue. Well, have you thought then that maybe teaching 1,800 students that the world does operate this way and you don't have any evidence that it does, have you considered that might be the height of irresponsibility to do that? No, absolutely not. I think the height of irresponsibility is to ignore the reality of God, to, to ignore the reality of the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, oh, what? You, but you're using the word reality. You just said that there's no empirical evidence. Oh, there is empirical evidence. No, oh, now there, there is. There is absolute empirical. No, it's not a matter of now there is. I said a moment ago, there's absolute empirical evidence that Jesus existed, that he was real. And no, that, no, I mean about the world working. You, you said that it's a matter of faith that the world operates, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, needs to fill you and that there's going to be a resurrection. You said all, I mean, all of that stuff you'll admit is, is not scientifically. Faith. Yes, Absolute. it's faith. That is so faith. since it's faith, and since it's your faith, I mean, what do you think about teaching a, a kindergarten child that the world works that I way? I don't have any problem with that at all because we, it is a matter of saying to young people, this is what we believe to be true, and every person has to ultimately be accountable for what they believe. Okay, well, have you thought about maybe adding to the statement of faith here, maybe a number eight, um, by the way, we might be wrong and you should investigate for yourself? No. We, well, I, let me tell you, I wouldn't put that on the statement of faith, but we say to all of our kids coming through, this is something you must believe yourself. Now, there are kids who come to our school who do not believe Christianity. So we're saying, okay, that's okay. Make that statement, but now write a position paper that proves that your position is correct. So the burden of proof is on the student who would say that the world operates according to scientific principles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the rest of the students are basically taught that they must believe that the world operates according We're to these supernatural principles. They must believe principles. anything. We're saying that here's what the Bible says. Our basis is the Bible and the person has to decide whether they believe the Bible to be true or whether they believe the Bible to be false. But this is, the Bible is first century and before symbolic literature. I mean, do you really think it's a good thing to teach children that it's literal? Well, literal interpretation, uh, for example, uh, God created the world in seven days. Does that mean seven 24-hour days, or does that mean that a day is a million years? What does that mean? And there, there are all kinds of arguments that take place within the Christian community about that. Well, that's true. I was taught very specific things here. For example, it says here in the handbook, the principal emphasis of the school is to encourage and to lead students to accept Jesus Christ can, can we stop, as their can Savior we stop for a and to commit themselves to Christ as Lord of their lives. I we, mean, need, we need to stop for a minute. I, why? 
I, I want to ask you a question off the, off the camera. Well, why off? I mean, I'll answer it. I'm, I'm here. I mean, you, you can ask me anything. I mean, what I wanted to talk to you about was, I mean, ideas. I, I was taught at this school that you would be eternally damned if you denied the Holy Spirit. Brian, you know what you've done? You've well, been dishonest in setting up this interview. What, what, what is dishonest? I, I wrote you an email and... Yeah, and, and, I, I, and, and, and there's, we're, we've been spending the last five to seven minutes trying to make you feel good about what you feel you were punished at here, not what you told me we were going to talk about. I told you we were going to talk about the education of children. I'm, I'm here to talk about the education. Now you're ending the interview? Uh -huh. Why are you ending the interview? All right. Dr. Sipis wouldn't talk to me on camera anymore, so there wasn't much reason to stay. But then as I was leaving, I noticed the chapel was open. This is the chapel where I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. I sat right here on this bench once and did that. Also sat over here and did it again because I had backslid. And then in a later grade, I sat back there and did it yet again. I was born again at least three times, I think. I gotta hold up the camera myself here in this chapel where I first accepted Jesus as my personal savior. I just want to say one thing. I deny the Holy Spirit. told in the past uh, that uh, commercial airlines are not allowed to be flown by two Christians just in case one of them suddenly disappears. The airlines are covering themselves. So they have a, a screening procedure to make sure that there's one I, Jewish I honestly, pilot, one Christian pilot? <laughs> I honestly don't know okay. if, if that's a requirement or if that's just a rumor. Okay. I just, I've heard that a couple of times over the past 10 years. No. But you haven't verified it. I've never verified, verified it. it. Okay. All right, let me give you a scenario. Okay. You're dead. Uh, I hope of old age. Right. I'm not talking about it. Probably from the Jesus Land versus Blue State <laughs> War, but we're, let's just say this, is, this time it's old sure, age. Sure, sure. And you find yourself in hell. Mm -hmm. And you're being roasted on a pit, and every hour on the hour you have to suck Satan's greasy cock, or whatever <laughs> they make you do down there. I hear it's really bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't you wish you would have believed? It would have been so easy just to believe. Well, no, because it wouldn't really be any better. If I had to sit in heaven forever, knowing that there are these people, millions and millions, probably billions of people, suffering these eternal, horrible torments, and there was nothing I could ever do for them, that, to me, would be hell. There are jokes about the Pope dies and uh, goes to heaven. St. Peter greets him, as St. Peter often does in these stories, and says, you know, you led a very holy life on earth, and. Uh, if there's anything you want here in heaven, we'd be glad to accommodate you. We'd like to reward your faithful service on earth. Is there anything we can do for you? Folks says, well, he says, I, you know, I've never seen the original form of the Bible. So he says, okay, fine. He ushers him into a little room, and there on the table is the original version of the Bible. And he leaves him alone in there to, to browse through it. After a few minutes, he hears the Pope exclaim, oh, he says, oh my goodness, he says, the word is celebrate. When my Jesus paper came out, I got a few nasty letters saying that, well, they, that basically people are trying to pray that I'll be saved, but I have not yet been saved. Any chance? No. Nope. I'm happy the way I am. I'm happy with my life. Come on to because it is taboo to criticize religious faith uh, and any convictions born of religious faith, we have the, the spectacle, really the travesty, of college-educated politicians endorsing social policies. Uh, to take one example, blocking stem cell research or impeding it, impeding its funding at least, um, on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, on the basis of metaphysical dogmas, in this case the dogma that the soul enters the zygote at the moment of conception, uh, 
And this leads people who should know better to, to stand on the floor of the Senate or in the Oval Office and speak uh, first century platitudes which are meant to serve as ethical arguments against what is undoubtedly one of the most promising lines of research in biology to, to remediate a host of, of uh, you know, scores, potentially, of, of terrible, debilitating uh, diseases. Somebody made up a parody of these sort of like pleas from from sick or, or you know physically handicapped children to you know be my friend or send money, and it was uh, about this boy called Billy who supposedly um, had had to have his body removed, and it was replaced with a burlap sack full of leaves, and uh, you know won't you please send money or send me an email and. You know, we would get this over and over from people asking, is this, this true? Is true, yeah. that this boy was just a head. <laughs> Attached to a burlap sack full of leaves. And yeah. in dire need of new leaves. <laughs> I guess as of about the age of 11, I became a fundamentalist Baptist and got involved in the youth work and the, the church. And I will always be grateful to uh, them for uh, instilling in me a, an insatiable curiosity about the Bible. But that very thing, eventually, a few years later, I guess, when I was in the middle of uh, theological seminary, made me realize that uh, the Bible just couldn't be realistically dealt with if you believe that it was an inspired book with no contradictions or errors. That was just a, uh, like a set of blinders, that there was so much that didn't make sense that way. And I finally decided, well, as Mircea Eliade said, that uh, in the West we found off and we've had to give up uh, faith in, uh, in exchange for the truth. Uh, the knowledge is more important and I made that adjustment and uh, it's been many years since I did but I now find myself again a church goer. I, I go to the Episcopal Church and I, I love what is going on there and the symbolism and the liturgy precisely because I understand it is mythology. It really is a faith issue. People say well uh, what's the difference between evolution as a fact and creationism as a fact? The truth of the matter is neither one are facts because if, if you can't replicate either one. You, you, it is a, you can see evidence of evolution within species, but you can't see it from, from species to species, from, from any, any of that. But, but it, is, it, is, uh, it is not scientifically without flaw itself. Uh, creationism has all kinds of evidences, scientific evidence, that more and more, the more we find out about science, the more we see that it is, it is accurate but my personal belief in Jesus Christ is a faith issue. One, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three.